The album Aftermath is usually thought of by scholars and critics of the Rolling Stones to be a really crucial album uh, in the group's development. Uh, probably most, in the most important way, uh, because all the songs on the record, and there are two versions, uh, an American version and a UK version, but if you take all the, uh, both the versions and collect all the songs together, uh, 15 tracks uh, in all, uh, they're all songs written by Mick Jagger and Keith Richardson. We haven't seen that yet. As we've been looking across the first four albums that precede this, we've seen more and more originals sort of making their way in uh, or onto these albums. And of course, more and more singles and B-sides being original material. But we haven't yet had an album that's been dominated completely uh, by Jagger and Richards' original. So that's, that's really kind of an important point of arrival uh, for the group. This album is recorded at RCA it, during those December 1965 sessions and also during the March 1966 uh, sessions. Uh, released in the UK in April, but as I said in the last video, not released in the United States until June. Um, the, the, the album, in fact, could have been released earlier in the United States. Uh, but there's a crazy story that the Rolling Stones had an idea that some of the songs on this record would be on an album, kind of almost kind of, I don't know if it was a concept album or what they had in mind here called, Could You Walk on the Water? <laughs> And well, I guess, you know, the walking on the water part maybe had too many kind of religious overtones and with the stones being seen as rebellious, uh, it possibly could have been seen that they were, um, you know, uh, making fun of organized religion. Now that didn't work out so well for John Lennon in 1966. So it turns out that maybe the record company was on to something here. So instead of bringing out the album the Stones had wanted to bring out called Could You Walk on the Water, uh, they brought out their big hits album, High Tides in Green Grass. So they brought out the compilation um, in the first half of the year. And then Stones adding more tracks to the Aftermath album brought it out uh, as Aftermath in June uh, of 1966. As we listen to this record, we can hear that the instrumentation becomes more adventurous. And as I've said a couple of times during these lectures, really it's Brian Jones. He's not the only one thinking about adventurous things to do with the music. I mean, don't forget, recording in RCA in Hollywood, uh, you're recording with people who've been doing all of those big uh, Los Angeles productions. And who has recorded in, uh, in Los Angeles? Uh, Brian Wilson with the Beach Boys and, and Phil Spector. And so there's, there's a lot of kind of combinations of sound and playing around in the studio, especially with regard to uh, Brian Wilson. And so this idea of experimenting the studio was certainly not something the Rolling Stones dreamed up or Brian Jones dreamed up. But Brian Jones was the, the musical guy in the group who could try all these different uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, instruments. And so they make it on uh, to the songs and make them uh, very, very ambitious and adventurous musically. As I said before, 15 tracks on this record. The UK uh, version has got 14 tracks on it, and the American version of the album has got 11 uh, tracks on it. Four of the songs out of those 15 are released only on the UK version, and one uh, is um, released only uh, on the U.S. version. Uh, so uh, as we have done before, we're going to think of Aftermath as being kind of a combination of both the U.K. Uh, and the U.S. Uh, editions because they really are all really pretty much part of the same project, just brought out slightly differently in each uh, country. So as we said before, um, uh, number one album uh, in the UK, number two album in the US, uh, produced by Andrew Oldham. Uh, Andrew Oldham's days as producer are kind of numbered at this point. Uh, he'll he'll produ also produce Between the Buttons, but after that, um, he doesn't produce too much more for the Rolling Stones, and there's a separation between Andrew uh, and the band. As we said before, recorded an RCA, which means that these tracks were uh, engineered by Dave Hassinger, who after this album is not going to have a whole lot more influence on the Rolling Stones don't sound as they move away from the RCA studios to Olympic. But here, uh, probably the sort of greatest moment for the Rolling Stones, Dave Hassinger, those RCA studios, they've, they've got it all together here, and this is sort of the point of arrival here. Now, as I go through the songs uh, that are on this album, Aftermath, I want to take note of a couple of things uh, uh, as we go. Um, I want to ask the question, We've got a band here who for four albums were doing lots and lots of cover versions. And we, at the end of last week, we kind of list, listed out a bunch of styles that they had, that they had 
sort of used, uh, uh, styles of music that they had covered. So there were, of course, obviously blues because that's a big part of the group's um, uh, origins in the British blues scene, uh, but also country and gospel and R&B and pop, uh, a lot of different kinds of styles. So now what we want to do is, as musicologists, we want to think, well, as these guys were learning their craft, they were covering, sometimes covering very closely, all these songs by other artists. As they do their original songs now, can we some, somehow see the influence of those other cover versions they've done. In other words, can we see the R&B influence? Can we see the influence of people like Otis Redding or, or Muddy Waters or, or uh, uh, people like that or gospel? So can we see that in their actual music? And not just because somebody in an interview says, oh yeah, I was very influenced by this. No, I mean in the actual music, can we hear it? And if we didn't know there was an influence, would we notice it anyway? This kind of thing. And so as I go through each song, I'll suggest some, some ways in which I think each of these songs uh, may have been influenced by other styles that they have already covered. By the way, by saying this, I don't mean that the Rolling Stones music is derivative or weaker because of these influences. What I mean to do is to make connections to show that, that, that in many ways they modeled their own music on music that they loved and had already played. And this is, in, in the history of music, going back through jazz and classical music, going back hundreds of years, a very typical way in which young artists learn their craft. We call it modeling or model composition. You use the, the, the example of some great piece or, or some piece that you really like before that, come, that came before you, and you model your own work on it. And if that's happening here, we ought to be able to see those influence finger points or fingerprints uh, on each of these pieces. So that's what I mean. So as we go through, uh, please uh, bear that in mind. Uh, the first of the tracks that will, and some, some of these tracks we'll get back to in the song close up. Paint It Black, a song that only appeared on the US version of Aftermath, uh, uh, features the sitar. It's got a kind of Indian tinged verse, and, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about that uh, when we get to the song close up. Mother's Little Helper. Um, has got a kind of Leslie guitar sound. It almost seems like a kind of blend between country music and ethnic minor music. It almost seems like Mother's Little Helper almost seems like it could be some kind of a Eastern European or Russian kind of folk song in a certain kind of way with the, the sort of um, angular little guitar line uh, on the top there. So there, there we see a, a little bit of a kind of uh, ethnic uh, influence that we have maybe haven't seen so much in the cover stuff. The sitar in Paint of Black kind of refers to some of the ways in which We'll go, things are going psychedelic. Remember, there had been Norwegian wood uh, with the Beatles and the sitar and George Harris and all the sitar. The kinks were fooling around with, with something that, that would end up being called raga rock. So that's, that's all part of the kind of contemporary thing. Uh, the song Stupid Girl has got a hint of surf, maybe American garage rock, Farfisa, I think Paul Revere and the Raiders, the Kingsmen, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, Lady Jane is very, very much got a classical influence, which is not new to the Rolling Stones music. Think of as tears go by, uh, but also uses uh, the dulcimer. So you've got Brian uh, Jones on the dulcimer for that one. Uh, Lady Jane is an interesting one because it really tries to be almost like a kind of a Shakespearean kind of love song. Check out the lyrics on that and the way that Mick tries to do a kind of a Shakespearean uh, kind of thing uh, having to do maybe with Henry VIII or something, I'm not quite sure. Under My Thumb, we'll talk about that one in a close-up. The vibraphone there, that's very interesting in terms of the, uh, the influence there. Don't You Bother Me? Pretty clearly a blues number, and we've seen plenty of blues uh, in the Rolling Stones uh, repertory. This one here they are uh, writing their own. The song Going Home on the Aftermath album is interesting. As a song, it's kind of a, a cross between blues, country, and kind of old time music, but it goes on for over 10 minutes. It's kind of a what I think what they would have called a rave up or a kind of extended tune where they just kind of jam out the ending. And it gives us a sense of maybe what those what those nights at the Crawdaddy Club might have been like when they were stretching out a lot of the songs that we're used to hearing in the two or three minute versions. Maybe they were stretching those tunes out. So we get a bit of that uh, on the song Going Home. This idea of stretching out instrumentally we're going to come back to after Brian Jones has left the group and Mick Taylor enters the group. And the kind of stretching out they'll do then is going to be much more about virtuosity and instrumental mastery. Here, this one, the, the, the way they stretch out going home, probably has a lot more to do with just kind of creating a kind of a party atmosphere. And there's, there's not a lot of sort of fantastic or virtuosic soloing uh, going on here. The song Flight 505, 
It reminds me of Chuck Berry and Little Richard. It seems to me that's, uh, that's what they're modeling there. High and Dry seems like a kind of a mix of country, country and blues, maybe a kind of a country blues uh, kind of thing. Uh, Out of Time, that is a fantastic pop song that was also covered uh, by Chris Farlow. And uh, I'll tell you, it shows that Mick and Keith uh, could really write a brill building style hit. I'm a little amazed that they did their own version of it uh, because they tended to keep those kinds of songs away from the group. But you know, standing by itself and aside from the Rolling Stones, it's a fantastic uh, piece of pop songwriting, I think, only my opinion, I suppose. Uh, the song It's Not Easy is kind of a Chuck berry -ish song. Chuck Berry maybe meet soul uh, kind of thing. I'm Waiting is a kind of an acoustic folk or folk rock uh, kind of uh, track. Uh, Take It or Leave It, which uh, only appeared on the UK version of the record. I don't know, it seems to me like it could be kind of Beatles influenced perhaps. The song Think seems like it could be influenced maybe by Otis Redding. And the song What To Do seems like it's a kind of a soul number that might have been uh, recorded by somebody like the Coasters or the drifters. So as I went through all 15 of those tracks, you saw that there was both an emphasis on the uh, instrumentation and sort of bringing new sounds into the group, different ways of, of, of interpreting the whole rock pop uh, idea sonically. And also, you can see a lot of the influences from things that we've talked about before working their way into these all original Jagger Richards tunes. Well, before we move on to the song Close Ups, let me just say a, a word or two about these other two records that were released uh, in 1966. Um, now, Big Hits, High Tide and Great Grass, that one we already talked about as being the, the compilation that the, um, that the label uh, in the U.S. brought out instead of the early version of Aftermath, Could You Walk on Water? Um, and so we talked a bit about that, but the interesting thing about that album is there's a British release of Big Hits, High Tide and Great Grass, which is released late in 1966, uh, in November of 1966, goes to number four in the UK, uh, and it's got a slightly different uh, uh, track list, um, uh, tunes that, that uh, f uh, what do we have here, five different tunes that were only, only appeared uh, on the UK version of it. And so of course, time, a considerable amount of time had passed, six months or so between the March and, uh, and November releases there, and so it was seen wise to include some other things in the UK version. But just to be aware, there are two pretty different versions of that compilation, but both of them are really compilation records and not new studio work for the, for the group. And then there's Got Live If You Want It. We've already said a bit about that one too. The US version, which is a full LP, as opposed to the UK version, which was just an EP, uh, was released in December of 1966 in the US. Only goes to number six uh, in the charts, uh, again, uh, in, time for the, in time for the Christmas market. Uh, it's drawn mostly from live shows from October of 1966. And so they, this is sort of the, the set they had been doing. Uh, and so it was recorded up uh, while they were in Europe and, and brought out uh, in the United States. Uh, the song Time on My Time is on My Side and I'm All Right are go back to March of 1965. So uh, those recordings um, uh, not quite part of the same set from October of 66. What I find it interesting is that there are actually two songs on that Got It Live If You Want It that were recorded in the IBC studios in October of 1966, like in the studio, recorded live in the studio, that they went, then they went back and added audience overdubs in. So they like recorded the thing in a studio because I guess they wanted the songs to be, they didn't have the right live recording or whatever, there were mistakes or not the right sound. So they recorded in the studio, you can really tell. I mean, you can really tell it's, it's a much cleaner sound and all this kind of thing. And then they sort of put all the bullfight cheers and all that kind of thing on it to make it seem like it was live. So there's a little bit of sleight of hand uh, going on with those two tunes. They're not really live. Live in the studio, I suppose they're kind of live. Uh, but they sound much less like the live recordings and the songs uh, around them. Uh, there are, um, there is one song, uh, I'm All Right, which is, uh, which is from the UK version of this record. So that these two records, the EP in the UK and the LP from the US only share one record, one song between the two of them. And two of the songs that are on the US version were recorded live in the studio with audience sounds dubbed in. The Rolling Stones, as I reminded you last week, have pretty much disowned both these live records. They don't even think of them as really official Rolling Stones live records. They probably, in their mind, fall in the category of just product we got out because that's what we thought we were supposed to do. We had to deliver product. Uh, they'd really consider Get Your Yayas Out to be their first real 
live album, bona fide live album. So just keep that in mind uh, as we move ahead. All right, well, let's look at some of these songs now in a little bit more detail. Next video, we'll do a song close up and we'll look at 19th Nervous Breakdown, Paint It Black, Mother's Little Helper, and Under My Thumb.